Okay, so now, you know, this is the next test right there, thermal regulation, heat transfer, mechanisms of heat transfer, thermal regulation, thermal ne neutral zone, you might want to, you always want to keep your animals in the thermal neutral zone. Like we are, most of us right now are in the thermal neutral zone. But look at us, how different we are. I'm wearing shorts, some of you still have your coats on, right, and sweaters. I would be absolutely sweating if I had that sweater on right now. So that tells you even within a species, different animals would see different temperatures. Then there's, okay, there's something, there's a mechanism in some animals that cool the brain, we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about heat loss. But what I wanted to do, because I was playing around with it in the other room, I want to do a Google search. So this isn't in the reading, this isn't, well, it's somewhat in those videos. But I want to do heat transfer mechanisms and tell you what I come up with and then how a lot of times there's something missing. So I'm going to go to the images and I am going to pick out some of these. Okay, so now this one, and I'm, gonna, I'm playing around with how to get these bigger. Okay, nope, 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 it's uh, crazy. Okay, I'm bad at this. Okay, anyway, conduction, convection, radiation. That's three, and a lot of those images only talk about those three, but there's actually two missing. So when we are talking about <coughs> heat transfer mechanisms, make sure you have five down in your notes. Four are important for animals. One is not very important. And a lot of times, um, when you look this up, they talk about these three mechanisms, okay? So, and so I'm going to introduce these a little bit. And a lot of times you won't find what I'm going to say now. These are called sensible heat transfer mechanisms. Sensible, S-E-N-S-I-B-L-E. -E. Not like, it doesn't mean it's like logical, you're being sensible. No, sensible means at the moment of transfer, you could detect the heat transfer by a thermometer. Sensible heat transfer mechanisms. Those, those three up there are sensible. The other two, which I haven't named yet, but you can write down the category, they're called insensible. I N insensible heat transfer mechanisms. But it's kind of nice, it's kind of fun to look at what the world does because you've got the reading, you can do that outside of class, you've got the videos, you can read that. But we can talk about how people portray these things, okay? So conduction sometimes is called heat diffusion. And it always happens in a solid material. But then I also have to add that it can happen in water or even blood that's totally still. It has to be still. So blood is hardly ever still in the body, right? But if you're doing something in physics, you can have a body of water, you can have a tube of blood, whatever. So it's got to be transferring through something solid, but remember it could be still water or still blood, okay? <coughs> when you see the word convent, convection, something has to be moving. So it's a flowing medium. Mass motion of molecule. Basically, it could be moving water, could be moving blood, it could be moving air. And convection, if you're outside early this morning and if it was windy, what would you call convection out there? Wind chill. Wind chill. So, wind chill is a form of convection. And obviously, if you have dogs or livestock, wind chill can kill them if it's bad enough, right? So <clears throat> you got to be aware of that. But here's the other thing. Trees never have any wind chill. 
Wind chill only affects something that has a temperature above ambient. So ambient temperature, right, is, I think last night it got down to 22. Well, if we're standing here and we'd say, what's the ambient temperature? It would be the temperature of this room for us. Because ambient means the air that's surrounding you. So here the ambient air is about 70. Outside, at least early this morning, it was 22, okay? But a tree is always the same temperature as the wind. So a tree, wind chill doesn't exist for that. It's only something that has a temperature that's above the ambient, okay? So now a motor could be affected by wind chill, right? When you shut it off, it's been like close to 200 degrees. And if the wind's blowing, it's going to, you know, cool, give heat to the air. But for animals, they're always affected by wind chill because their body, hopefully, is always above ambient in the wintertime. So, and then that's another thing. Wind chill has no effect really in the summertime. It's really winter, cooler temperatures. And then radiation, make sure you write down electromagnetic radiation. That's what it is transfer by, you know, and wherever it says energy, you could substitute heat. Heat is transferred by direct contact. Heat is transferred by the mass motion of molecules. Heat is transferred by electromagnetic radi radiation. And the best uh, example of electromagnetic radiation is going outside on a sunny day, like today, rather than stand in the shade, you'd like to stand in the sun. That's an example of radiation. I don't like that name because when you think of radiation, you're going to think of a nuclear disaster and the radiation. It's a different radiation, okay? And, but the thing is, if I get close enough to that wall, I'm gonna radiate heat to the wall, okay? So it doesn't have to be sun. Everything kind of can radiate heat. Okay? But it's kind of fun to look at what people have, these images, and just point out some things, okay? Um, because there's a lot we can talk about. Okay, so here it is, conduction. is a flow of heat by direct contact between a warmer and a cooler body. This means for heat to flow, there has to be a difference in temperature. There has to be a temperature differential, otherwise heat will not flow. And heat is brainless. All these mechanisms are like in a physics book. And when heat flows, it goes from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. It's called flowing down your thermal gradient. Heat never flows up. So if two things are in direct contact and there's a difference in temperature, you know the heat is flowing from the warmer temp, the warmer object to the small, the cooler object. Like this coffee cup, when I hold it, I don't have my thermal gun along, but I could check it. It's still a little warmer than my hand, so it feels warm. That means my hand is gaining heat from the coffee through this cup, right? And we'll talk about things, if you don't want heat to flow, between two objects, like let's say my hand and the coffee, what do you call something you put in between two objects that if you want to stop or slow down heat flow? Insulation. Insulation. Okay? And if you raise animals and they're in a barn, it's nice to have something on the floor other than ground or cement if it's cold, right? You add some material that's a poor conductor, that's another, a poor conductor is a good insulator. So you want a good insulator if you want to stop heat flow, but if you want to increase heat flow, you have a good conductor and a poor insulator. Like most of the dogs that come to classes, especially over Lily, if they get hot, they lay on the floor in lateral recumbency because they're smart enough, or sometimes they lay with their chest down. But a lot of times, like we had a dog in Lily the other last week, and it was hot, it laid down on its side because linoleum 
is cooler than its body, so it's transferring heat from its surface into the linoleum. Okay, and that's a good way of thermal regulation. So, okay, conduction then. But remember, you know, they usually talk about some object, but it could be still water. Heat can transfer through still water by conduction. Okay, then convection is a flow of heat carried, okay, carried by a moving gas or liquid. The gas is air, right, in our case, like we're talking about wind chill, or a liquid, blood. Oh, here's the other thing. Warm air rises, okay? If you've seen those big dairy barns, they take big advantage of that because if you look up, often the peak of the roof is open. Like they forgot to finish the roof. It's like one side comes up and one side comes up like this, the other side, and it's like open. And the roof is slanted like this, and the heat from the dairy cow rises, goes out the peak, pulls air from the side. And whenever that happens, that's called natural convection. When, he, when the warm air rises, that's natural convection. If you had a fan up there in the, in the top, pulling air out, that's forced convection. So there's two kinds of convection. Natural, which means hot air rises, basically. Or in, in water, too, it would. Hot, air, hot water rises to the surface. OK, gives up heat, cools, then falls. OK, radiation, flow of heat without, OK. Radiation, the flow of heat without need for, of an intervening medium. Another way of saying that is it could happen in a vacuum. When you feel the heat from the sun, that came through space, and space is a vacuum. So the other two mechanisms need some kind of mass there, right? Flowing or solid. Radiation doesn't need anything to be transferred. Now, I can transfer heat right to the wall, and there's air in between us. But I don't really need that air between us. OK, infrared light, OK. so. All these little things bring up some good points. Okay, um, let's do this one. Okay, heat can be transferred by three different ways. And the other thing is, they're not really thinking about the other mechanisms when they make these tables. And it's just a little, a little disheartening, but I'll show you how I can change my search and find some images that list some more heat transfer mechanisms. So this one, okay, all modes of heat transfer require the existence of a temperature difference and uh, transfer are from high to low. Yeah, we already said that, okay, that's the same. Okay, here's another one. When you're talking about buildings or animals, all these mechanisms are operating at the same time. So when you look at an environment, you go, okay, what's conducting heat? Where's convection happening? And what are you doing for radiation? And that's a, right now. We're subject to forced convection right now. Why? Look at all those uh, vents. So there's some mechanical fan someplace moving air. So that's forced convection. Uh, you're sitting on those seats. They're pretty well insulated, but you're probably losing a little heat to the seat. And we could prove that Wednesday because we could have an empty seat, take its temperature by the infrared gun, have somebody sit on it, like a volunteer, and then we, <laughs> and then we could, that would be a fun experiment, and then see how long the seat got, and you know if he transferred to the seat, right? So that's the other thing you got to remember. Usually all these mechanisms are occurring simultaneously, okay? And that includes the other two we haven't mentioned yet. It's kind of like a secret. But all heat transfer mechanisms can be operating at the same time. They don't have to be, but they often are. OK. Um, so here's another example. Uh, conduction. Through solids, mostly. See how they're hedging? Mostly. Because conduction can happen in still water, still blood. Uh, they're showing somebody the heat, you have that little poker in the fire, you're going to 
feel it sooner or later. Heat rises, convection, and then radiation on the other side. Okay. So, you know, that would be maybe not a bad thing for students to do, go through some of these images after a search and see what they're talking about. Okay. Uh, transfer, okay, more electron, yeah, adjacent, yes. Conduction can take place, you know, this one's pretty good. Solids, liquids, gases. So I, I, I forgot to add still air for conduction. I, you know, I was saying solid, and I was saying still water, or still blood, but I should have added still air, okay? Uh, yeah, and there's collisions of molecules, right, due to the combination of vibrations. I'm going to change my, reset my camera here. Okay, so now let me add something to the search and show you how I can get those other mechanisms up, at least the most important one. So now, and I practiced this this morning, so hopefully it works, heat transfer mechanisms, and then I'm going to add the word evaporation. Because that's one of the other heat transfer mechanisms. So now look at this visual. Now they've got four. So see how confusing it is? The first search got three. All the visuals were three. Now this one added the fourth. So let's talk about evaporation. That's insensible. We said that earlier. Insensible means... At the moment of heat transfer, you cannot pick it up with a thermometer. So what, another way of saying that is heat is being transferred, but it can't be measured by a thermometer, which is really weird. And you know evaporation. Look how important it is for dogs, right? Panting. Us, we sweat. You know, there's really only two animals that sweat very much. Us, and what's the other one? Horses. Horses and us, we're great sweaters. Not many else, not many other animals sweat, hardly at all. There's some that have, you know, dogs have sweat glands on their pads and their feet. If you ever <coughs> see a dog walking on a living room on the floor, you'll see some moisture behind them. But evaporation is a phase change of water. Evaporation goes from liquid to gas. And that's called a phase change. And that takes thermal energy. So at the moment of the phase change, you're using thermal energy. But if you measured the liquid right before it evaporated and the gas after it evaporated, the temperature is the same, which is a little hard for my mind to work. but it's the same. The heat went into the phase change. So wherever that, on the surface of the tongue of the dog or the respiratory tract, water is going to vapor, and that's taking thermal energy away from that surface that it's happening. So what's uh, the rules? Heat flows from warmer to cooler. It has no choice. The greater the temperature gradient, the greater the amount of heat that's transferred. Which means, the num if the numbers are greatly different, you're getting a lot of heat transfer. If the numbers are very close together, like 10 degrees and 12 degrees, not much heat transfer, right? So we might as well add the fifth mechanism. Uh, so you could add under evaporation. It's, okay, it's very similar to evaporation. What's the absolute opposite of evaporation? Condensation, and that's the heat transfer mechanism. So those two, evaporation and condensation, you know, are insensible. And they're totally opposite. What one does, the other one does just the opposite. So if evaporation takes liquid water to vapor, condensation, condensation takes vapor to liquid. If evaporation takes thermal energy away from that surface, you better know condensation adds thermal energy to that surface. Everything you can say about it is opposite. 
the four they have there are the most important of all the five. You know, that's the four most important ones. Condensation, some people don't even talk about it. Because animals are usually not an environment where water is appearing on their skin. Once in a while, yeah, but it's much condensation is much more important for engineers because leaky pipes. You can have pipes dripping and it's not coming from the inside. It's moist air hitting the pipe and condensating on the outside. So sometimes you build a house and if you leave a pipe exposed to like the humid air in the summer, you'll get dripping. Because the humidity in the air condenses on the pipe and it's dripping and you might think the pipe's leaking, not at all, okay? If you run your air conditioner in the summer, don't you see a puddle of water under your car if it's sitting there? That's condensation of the humidity that's in the air. It's not, it's not coming from your car at all. It's hitting some cold pipe in the air conditioning, condensation, and it's just dripping on the floor. You might think, oh, my radiator's leaking. No, it's condensation. So anyway, yeah, uh, okay, so, so by adding that other term, I got evaporation. Now look at physics of heat loss from the body. So um, this is a good example of showing you all the heat transfer mechanisms work at the same time. Evaporation, okay. Now notice how the arrow for evaporation, it goes from the skin, the heat is leaving the body. Radiation, look at two ways. The wall is radiating to the guy and he's radiating to the wall. So that could be a two-way. Uh, air currents, convection, right? So if the air current is cooler than the body surface, he would lose the heat <coughs> to the air. But if the air current is coming from a heater, he would gain heat from the air. And the temperature difference would tell you what's going on. And then he's sitting, that's my example of the chair, he's conducting heat to the object as long as the object is cooler than him. And in most cases, and we'll show this Wednesday, all the objects in this room are the same temperature. If they've been here long enough, they've equilibrated. The wall, the chairs, everything, except don't get too close to the vents, because if there's cool air coming there or heat, then it's not, not going to be uh, right. But everything is the same temperature. The temperature at this end of the table, that end over there, the floor, everything's equilibrated. Okay. So now, um, so there's a lot of examples here. Let me do one other search. The reason I'm showing you other searches is because then you can do these. Factors affecting conduction, heat conduction. So now what I'm trying to say is, let's look at conduction and how we can either minimize it or maximize it. If you've got a hot dog, you want to maximize conduction of heat away from the hot dog. You never want a dog to get overheated, especially the bigger ones, because it takes so much to cool them off. So let's do this. Uh, and let's see. I'm going to try to find some that are very straightforward. And, yeah, okay, okay, and if I don't find something perfect, I'll just start rattling them off myself. <clears throat> okay, anyway, the video has some, so let me just do this one here. Um, so, here's what we'll do. Factors affecting heat transfer by conduction. I'm adding on to this because... Who knows what that was going to end up on. So here it is. Surface area. Effective surface area. Of con for conduction. No, I'm doing that. So just add conduction at the, at the end of this title. Factors affecting heat transfer by conduction. Because they're different for each mechanism. Okay. So I said in our number one here in this table, it could be effective surface area. The more surface area, the more heat transfer. Let's say you've got a pot boiling on the stove and you touch it with a fingertip. 
Okay, there's going to be some heat transferred from the pot to your finger. But what if you grabbed it with your whole hand? You'd, you'd have to agree there'd be more heat transferring and more damage would be done. So effective surface area. So that's why the dog lays on its side because the side surface has more surface area that can touch the floor. If you're standing on four paws, that's not a lot of surface area. Look at how they can enlarge their surface area by many fold. Okay. So, um, effective surface area. Then the next one is temperature differential. How different are the two temperatures? So the dog laying on its side, you know, dog is 101.5 internally, but it's not on the skin. Except last week in one of my class, the other class, I had a sphinx cat. And I've never picked one up before, but immediately I said, wow, this cat's warm. Okay, that's the naked cat. Well, I'm just touching pure skin. I'm not, there's no insulation on it, the hair. So I was really stunning, like, wow, he feels hot. But no, every cat would feel that hot, right? So the temperature differential. Then, this one's good, the third one. Conductivity of the conductor. Boy, that sounds good. That sounds like you're in college. <laughs> the conductivity of the conductor. And since we're doing that, Okay, let's see. This is good. Oh, I just want, there's too many choices here now. Let's do, let me add conductors, let me add wood. So these, this is going to give us some numbers. Here we go. Now you don't have to worry about this. Uh, the units here. But the bigger the number, the more heat transferred per unit area. Let me see if I can enlarge that a little bit. And you can compare the numbers. You don't have to worry about the, uh, the units. Look at polystyrene foam, 0 0.026. So it's a great insulator, a poor conductor. Wood, pine, 0.113. So if you have a floor made out of wood or pine wood, that's, not, that's a pretty good insulator. Rubber, 0.138. But then look at the metals. Stainless steel, and then look at aluminum. So let's say aluminum, comparing this number to this, that's one, two, three, Four. Okay, 10 to the fourth difference. So aluminum is 225, gold 317, copper almost 400. Uh, when you see heating systems in homes, a lot of the pipes that transfer heat is made of copper. It's a very, if you have hot water running in a copper pipe, it's going to conduct heat to the surface. And then a lot of times they put little fins on there. If you've ever seen that, like a little where hot water runs through something, it's not just a pipe, it's got fins. And what do the fins do? I've already told you, how do you increase heat transfer by conduction? You increase the surface area with those fins. Okay? So there's all kinds of tables on this stuff. Now, there's wood, there's... There's other things, but the point is the thermal conductivity of the conductor makes a difference of how much heat is transferred. So that's the big ones on conduction. Surface area, temperature differential, the conductivity of the conductor. So let's do that for convection. I'm trying to make these smaller here. Um, Factors, oops, sorry, convection. 
Okay, there's force convection, and the videos have these too, but not all these. So I guess I'll just do convection myself. <clears throat> okay, I don't see anything custom made there. Okay, here it goes. Convection. Factors that affect heat transfer by convection. Effective surface area. So like in the winter time, if you don't wear a coat, you've got a lot of skin exposed. If you cover it up, you decrease your effective surface area. What do animals out on, let's say you've got some animals, like when I lived in Nebraska, they were always out in the corn stalks. How can an animal decrease its effective surface area if you're out there with a herd of 30 other cows? Huddle, huddling. As soon as the two cows get together, that surface that are touching each other is not available for <coughs> heat transfer. Huddling. What do we call that in human population? Cuddling. Cuddling. Thank you. <laughs> okay, just trying to get down. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> some people got that. Yeah. Okay. Surface area. Temperature differential. That's another one. So that kind of there's some similar things between the two. Okay, because if the temperature is big, that means bigger wind chill in the winter time, right? So if the wind chill is like very close to the ambient temperature, that's not a big deal. But if they say today's temperature is 10, but the wind chill is minus 20, right? So remember, wind chill is a man-made number. Trees aren't affected by wind chill. You can't be affected by wind chill unless you have some temperature to give up. So a dead body that's been out there in the, my music, I've watched some crime stories and there's somebody else being killed. If the body, oh, but that's the interesting thing is, do you know you can time the time of death by taking the body temperature of the body and knowing what it's laying, it's these principles, okay? So then, Velocity of the medium. That's the third factor. Velocity of the medium. Notice I'm not saying wind. I could, but then I want to make sure you know it could be blood. Could be water. Flowing. Could be air, right? In wind chill, it's air. Okay, I'm going to end there because then when I talk about radiation, I probably wouldn't have time to get the factors listed. See you Wednesday, all right? Some of us are staying here to do recordings.